What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment, and what I saw these young African Americans doing, was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up, and to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes, and I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell this story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center.
Good evening. Good evening. I see there's a lot of comments there asking about sound. Hopefully everyone uh, can hear just fine. If not, um, Kalila, just let me know if folks should, can they go out and come back in? If not, uh, stay here. Uh, and if you are also having issues, you can visit um, us online at youtube.com slash the Schomburg Center, and you can find this program streaming live there. Again, thank you all so much for joining us this evening as we begin a new season of educational and public programs at the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture. My name is Novella Ford. I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions. And as you saw in the video, the center is dedicated to the collection, preservation, and interpretation of global Black experiences from the past to the present. This, is, this season, we will continue to present virtual programs as we did throughout quarantine and begin to offer in-person programs at our Harlem location. There's a wonderful lineup, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a wonderful lineup featuring documentaries about trailblazers Polly Murray and Dick Gregory. We will revisit the seminal text, Black Reconstruction by W.E.B. Du Bois with Henry Louis Gates Jr. and Eric Fawner uh, and many others. We will also have our usual conversations in creative arts, from performing arts to visual arts. We have the Lapidus Center's um, Pandemic Legacy, which is a three-day virtual conference, and so much more. Our exhibitions and research divisions are open and available for your in-person visits as well. So please visit our website at schombergcenter.org to learn more about the center's reopening, our research divisions, our public programs, and digital collections. We are excited to kick off our fall season with conversations in Black Freedom Studies, Black Health, Medical Racism, Resistance, and Wellness. Next, you will hear from Jean Theo Harris, who is the co-creator of Conversations in Black Freedom Studies, as she introduces this season's co-curator, Dr. Robin Spencer. Just to tell you a little bit about Dr. Theo Harris, she is a distinguished professor of political science at Brooklyn College of City University of New York, and the author or co-author of 11 books and numerous articles on civil rights and the Black Power, and black power movements, the, the politics of race and education, social welfare, and and civil rights in post 9-11 America. Her biography, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, won a 2014 NAACP Image Award, among others. Please, again, a warm welcome for Dr. Theo Harris. Good evening. Thank you, Novella. Um, and thank you, uh, Kalila Bates Behind the Scenes. It is so wonderful to be here. Um, it is always so wonderful to see that Schomburg video um, of course, we wish we were together in Harlem, uh, but it's it's just kind of amazing that we can have conversations in Black Freedom Studies here online. Um, Kamozi Woodard, uh, who is a professor at Sarah Lawrence College, and I, um, in concert with the Schomburg Center and Khalil Muhammad, who was the director at that point, started Conversations in Black Freedom Studies nine years ago to create a space where the public could engage with new works in Black history. There were fewer and fewer public spaces, bookstores had closed, and so the idea was this would be a place, the Schomburg had long been a place to be, to bring together that kind of conversation to introduce us to new work in Black history and get to learn and think together. Um, Kamozi took on a more emeritus role last year, and I am so thrilled and delighted to welcome, introduce a new co-curator tonight, and that is Robin C. Spencer, Associate Professor of History at Lehman College uh, and the CUNY Grad Center. And so it is so exciting to be um, entering this new stage of conversations. Um, we are so pleased that the Schomburg uh, is continuing conversations online, um, and perhaps we will get to be in the building in um, over time. And as those of you who have been to conversations before know, we are here on the first Thursday of the month during the school year. So we'll be back in October, the first Thursday in October, in November, in December. Um, our next program, uh, Thursday, October 7th, we'll be looking at prison, political repression and surveillance. Um, but let me introduce Robin and she can tell you a little bit about tonight's panelists. Good evening, everyone. I'm so pleased to join the Conversation in Black Freedom Studies team 
I've spent some time on stage as a speaker and in the audience as a rap listener. And I'm so happy to step into this role as co-curator of the series alongside uh, Jean Theo Harris. I would like to welcome tonight's panelists. Uh, tonight we'll be hearing from Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens, who is the Charles and Linda Wilson Professor in the History of Medicine and Director of Humanities and Medicine Program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and the author of Medical Bondage, Race, Gender, and the Origin of American Gynecology. Dr. Owens, Cooper Owens will be in conversation with uh, Dr. Stephanie Y. Evans. Dr. Evans is a full professor and director of the Institute for Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Georgia State University and author of Black Women's Yoga History, Memoirs of Inner Peace. We'll also be hearing from Dr. Martin Summers, a professor of history and African and African diaspora studies at Boston College and the author of Madness in the City, of, Magnif of Magnificent Intentions, a history of race and mental illness in the nation's capital. And we'll also be uh, hearing from uh, Dr. George Amwat, an assistant professor of global health at Stony Brook University and director um, of the inaugural Global Health and Health Inequity Mapping Lab in Africana Studies. Welcome to the four of you. It's so wonderful to be here together for this incredibly timely conversation tonight on Black health, medical racism, resistance, and wellness. Um, so where we wanted to start tonight was to kind of begin with kind of where you began, right? Tell us about your research, but how did you come to this topic? What concerns or commitments motivated you, right? To kind of begin us where you began. And Professor Evans, why don't you start us off? Well, thank you so much. Of course, it's an honor to be here. I got kind of teary-eyed with the video. Um, it was, it's really an honor to be included on this. Um, I started writing about inner peace and felt quite silly doing it, um, really just out of basic necessity. I, um, I study Black women's intellectual history and memoirs as um, narratives of how to do things. So how to, for example, um, uh, exist in higher education. And so uh, I was studying Anna Julia Cooper, who many of us do, as one of the four founders of um, Black feminist thought, Black womanist thought, as this amazing educator. Um, but I was also dealing with a lot of anxiety, um, childhood trauma, work stress. I've been a department chair for 12 years now, and all sorts of these challenges, family challenges, um, you know, as we're really experiencing a lot going on politically, environmentally, all of these things were piling up. And um, so I just started to ask the question, um, how did those who come before us survive? And how most importantly, did we just survive despair, right? And so I looked at Anna Julia Cooper in a different light and started to ask, well, wait a minute, how did she live to be 105 and a half? you know, and raise five kids and earn her Sorbonne, you know, PhD at the Sorbonne and all of that. So my query really was um, trying to find some personal guidance from historical narratives, what I call historical wellness, to guide us through all of the things that we're experiencing. Thank you. Um, Professor Cooper Owens, how did you come to kind of this topic, this work? So I, I have to say uh, hello to everybody. I see you all in the chat, repping where you're from. So hello, I've seen familiar faces. And also thank you to the Schomburg um, for inviting me to share this space with you and the audience members. Um, I am very conscious of time because I can talk a lot. And those of you who know me on the panel know that. So I'm gonna stick to the three minutes. I became interested in this because I was always interested in the life, the, the life of, of Black women in the past, like the lives of these Black women I read about. I went to a all, um, all women's HBCU, Bennett College in North Carolina, and they had uh, a kind of women's 
history slash studies component. Uh, I got my master's from another HBCU, Clark Atlanta University, um, and they had an Africana women's studies program. Um, and so I was familiar with that. So when I went to UCLA, I was kind of shocked that black women weren't at the center <laughs> of things. Um, and so I remember reading a book by Janetta Cole and Beverly Guy Scheftel. Many of you have, have read the works of these two brilliant women and it was called Gender Talk. And in like literally two to three sentences just struck me as odd. It was about James Marion Sims performing experiments on enslaved women in Alabama in the 1840s. And I'm like, wait, what? How in the world did I go to these black colleges? I have a, a master's in African-American studies and I had no clue. And that really led me on the path of investigating the lives of enslaved women through medicine. Um, but there's a second part. So I just thought, okay, I'm, I'm gonna write about enslaved women in, in the 19th century and maybe 10 people will read my book. But when the book was published, there was a political moment happening of young people really having uh, cities and towns and universities reckon with a lot of racist iconography. And I was teaching at Queens College at the time and New Yorkers were up in arms about uh, James Marion Simpson's statue in Central Park. And my book highlights a lot of his work and I was really hesitant to, to kind of dip my toes into reproductive justice issues, right? Dip, dip my toe into that water. But black midwives and doulas in New York specifically said, okay, you wrote this wonderful book. Thank you, sis. But now what, what are we supposed to do with this information? And that literally set me on another track, kind of mid-career where I've been very, 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 um, wedded to the work of reproductive justice advocacy and using history as a tool where Black women are centered to help show people that we, we have answers um, and to, to be able to highlight and reveal those answers so that we can change certain structures that work, but dismantle the ones that are harmful. Thank you. Uh, Professor Onwat, how did Tell us about your journey to this topic and this work. Like my interlocutors, I'd like to first thank you, uh, Dr. Thea Harris, for having us and to congratulate Dr. Spencer on becoming your compatriot in this effort. Um, I also was very moved by the video introducing Schomburg's purpose. <clears throat> it was really great. Um, so for me, you know, I think it's always worth uh, being quite explicit about um, where we come from, what our roots are, and what our motivations are. And for me, this work is really, you know, um, a continuation of, of personal questions often and biographical questions about um, what happens when surplus is framed as a problem rather than a resource. And why is it that when surplus as a problem is pointed out, um, deprivation comes out of black and brown communities. Um, I'm the child of a nurse, uh, someone who immigrated here from Haiti, worked her way up through an associate's degree to become a licensed practical nurse and then later became a registered nurse. So from a very, very young age, um, I was always hearing lectures about nursing, hearing lectures about the healthcare system, um, and also uh, grappling with some of the ironies and contradictions um, as a young asthmatic who oftentimes had to deal with asthma attacks on my own as my mother was helping other people in the, in the hospital. And so just thinking about uh, labor and, and, and how we take care of our own and also how structures keep us away from taking care of one another um, has always been at the, the core of a lot of my questions. Um, the research trajectory really began um, when I became a Mellon Mays undergraduate fellow at Bowdoin College in Maine. Um, there, I worked with um, an architectural historian um, and people in the Africana Studies Department to begin to think about the HIV epidemic and to think about it outside of the framework of individual blame or interpersonal blame, and to kind of think more about the structures that led to uh, a worsening epidemic. And that led me to study ACT UP and to think about AIDS activism but also to think about sort of racialized um, stratification in the social movement, how 
ACT UP was oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, it was composed of a diverse group of people, but its leadership, its publicity oftentimes featured um, white activists. Um, and uh, despite that, there was an outgrowth of groups that came out of ACT UP, um, an outgrowth of movements that linked more specific aspects of the AIDS um, uh, and HIV epidemic to local communities. And when I got to grad school at Columbia, um, I began to expand these questions. I began to think about more um, structural questions, more about sort of giving a prehistory to the HIV AIDS epidemic, asking the question, well, we, are, we know the well-trodden story about um, bias and discrimination and homophobia and racism and xenophobia that melded into a you know vexing uh, mix of, of exclusion and, 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 and hurt. But we don't know so much about what happened to the very capacity of the hospital systems in which people were seeking out care. And so when I began my archival research, um, I did archival research in seven presidential libraries, gathered 20,000 slides, and images, it was a lot. But one of the things that popped up was um, this rhetoric of hospital cost containment. And I began asking myself, what is hospital cost containment? And it turned out that in the 70s, just as there was a sort of apex of the great society and efforts to um, achieve equity um, in healthcare, there was a sort of backlash, obviously a revanchist backlash or backlash against um, the welfare state um, overly taking care of poor people, black people, and hospital cost containment was this euphemism essentially for cost cutting. And I found reams of white papers and memos discussing this process of how do we take away hospital care without it coming across as discriminatory or um, singling out a particular group. And this is in the wake of the civil rights movement. And um, I began to think about the ways in which policy and, and the legal side of things um, combined to allow policymakers and municipalities to cut hospital beds and uh, ICU capacity and specialty care in inner cities, in rural areas, and predominantly black, brown, and poor areas of the country, while reconstituting those services in suburbs, majority white suburbs, um, under the logic that um, there would be better care provided, and that uh, even though care was taken out of uh, the inner city, people could just get on a bus and travel and get their care. Um, so these questions are coming into a book project that I've been developing, working on that grows out of my dissertation called Medical Scarcity. And I'm really thinking about the public hospital as a site of political economy, a site for distributing rights and resources. And uh, the study is a uh, series of case studies, thinking about health economics, thinking about the hospital closure campaign, thinking about um, the sort of rise of colorblind legal ideology and how that kind of smoothed the way towards these closures and reinterpreting the HIV AIDS epidemic and the bed shortages in that context, book ended with two policy histories that think about um, the development of healthcare rights, their uneven rise and fall um, before 1965 when Medicare and Medicaid was passed and after 1965. Um, so that's my work. Thank you. Professor Summers, round us off. Well, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, professors Theo Harris and Spencer for inviting me. As someone who uh, practically lived at the Schomburg from my dissertation and then as assistant professor working on my first book, it's a real honor to be uh, involved in uh, this panel um, for, for such an uh, important topic. Um, I, um, I actually stumbled into uh, my uh, work. I, uh, when I was a graduate student, I was basically doing work on, on a race, gender, and sexuality in late 19th, early 20th century US history, and specifically uh, work on black masculinity. And um, after I finished my first book, I started looking for a second uh, subject for a second book, and I thought, I would uh, continue down that road, and um, but particularly, I was uh, particularly interested in looking at how uh, black men constructed uh, kind of gendered uh, subjectivity uh, in relationship to the state, and in particular, state institutions like prisons and schools and the military and hospitals. And so, I and I uh, settled on 
Washington, D.C., because of the presence of Howard University and Freedman's Hospital and the U.S. Penitentiary and, of course, uh, uh, military presence, significant military presence in, in the District of Columbia. But I was also aware of uh, a, a mental hospital in Washington, D.C., St. Elizabeth's, uh, that I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. And so I was familiar with it as a child. Um, and uh, in the summer of 2001, I was at the National Archives and I noticed that the St. Elizabeth's had a record uh, collection. And so I started to just kind of poke around and I began with the admissions books. And uh, if you can imagine, this is a 19th century uh, insane asylum. And so the admissions book is this massive bound volume uh, with kind of frame pages, the, the binding of, of, of the book is deteriorating. You needed white gloves to actually turn the pages and you're often afraid that the pages are gonna um, uh, uh, tear as you, as you turn them. And um, I, I'll never forget, I um, came across the admission of a black woman in 1866, uh, her name was Leticia. And in these admissions books, there would be a column for the diagnosis and then also a column for the supposed cause. And um, her diagnosis was mania. And in the uh, supposed cause column, uh, the clerk had written the blackness of her husband. And that stunned me. Uh, I, I probably pushed my, you know, pushed the chair back when I saw it. And I, I had no idea what that meant. And um, I think it was probably at that moment where I said, I really need to figure this out. And so I started looking, um, de delving more deeply into uh, the records and decided that uh, this was actually a history I wanted to write, just a history of uh, Black patients at St. Elizabeth's and more generally, uh, a history of the role of racial difference, the role that racial, the ideas about racial difference played in the production of psychiatric knowledge, uh, as well as the development of the psychiatric profession. And I, ne I never actually found out what they meant by the blackness of her husband, but, uh, but uh, I, I still, it, it, was, it, it, it was a launching point for me uh, to delve into these larger questions. Thank you. And then you sort of turned us in the, towards where I want us to go, which is the, this is sort of the place where you teach teach us something. And so I guess what, what we would like now is for each of you um, to teach us, to tell us a story from your research and what it shows about the history of medical racism or health disparities or the kinds of resistance practices or wellness practices that black people have developed um, over the centuries. Um, and so, Professor Cooper Owens, I want to start with you. Sure. Tell us a story. You know, so I, I was thinking about this because there are lots of stories, but this is the one that I had to, to hold. And I don't, I'm, it's hard for me to hold secrets, especially good secrets, right? Um, that tell people's business that need to be told in the streets. But when I was a dissertation, when I was dissertating, as we call it in grad school, I, like Dr. Summers, um, I grew up in D.C. partially, and my dad worked at the National Archives. So my mother is very much into to family genealogy, and so she wanted to come help me at the archives. So we're going through all of the records in the microfiche, and I'm not looking for anything new. But because, remember, I, I stated earlier, I am trying to understand the history of American gynecology from the perspective of enslaved women which is difficult because A, I wasn't born in the 19th century. You know, I'm not enslaved. I mean, all of, all of these kinds of things, but I'm trying to understand how can I reinterpret what's been written? If I look at the records and these people are centered. So I'm looking at an 1850 census of the uh, enslaved people that James Marion Sims either owned or leased. Now I know his experimentation ended the year before. But as you know, because my dad worked at the National Archives, I also know that census, uh, the census isn't taken in the year it's published. The information is, is gathered, you know, at least a year or two before. So I'm looking and I see what everybody has written. 17 enslaved people are either leased or owned by him. I'm like, okay, check. And then I start to think, okay, what, what can this tell me about 
about the enslaved people because I don't have their names. I do have their ages and sex and race. That's it. So five of these, uh, five, of, five of the enslaved people are male, but they're all children. So, you know, I said, okay, these can't be the, the husbands of these women. They have to be the children of the women. Then I look at the, the remaining 12 and I X out the, the children, the actual young children or infants. And then I cross out a few of the women who are probably beyond childbearing age. So the numbers link up to what James Marion Sims wrote that he was experimenting on about, he said a, a little over half a dozen. So probably eight or nine women. As I'm going through the race, and this is important because black people, it's, it's so interesting. The census <laughs> documented them as property, but there wasn't necessarily a census before 1840 that documented black people, even though we know they exist, right? They existed. So this is the second census that lists black people. And I'm looking at race and one would think, oh, they're enslaved. So of course their race is Negro. Different categories of blackness, right? And so everybody says N, 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 N. I see an M for mulatto. And so now I'm intrigued. And I remember looking at this person, the only enslaved person out of the 17 who's listed as mulatto. She is the youngest person who is owned or leased by James Marion Sims. And so I remembered in the memoir that Sims wrote, The Story of My Life, he talked about the white community in Alabama withdrawing support, his two white male surgical assistants quitting, and he had to train these and save patients you know, to become nurses and, and, his, and his surgical assistants. This means that the woman who gave birth to this mulatto child got impregnated around the same time that the community withdrew support and these two white men who, were, who apprenticed under him quit. And so nobody ever looked at that census from the perspective of what can we gain about the enslaved people? They only looked at the, sentence, uh, the, the census records in terms of, well, how rich was Sims? What was his standing in the community in terms of the enslaved people that he owned or leased? And for me, it's a telling moment that I often teach my graduate students. I say, I didn't change the, the census. I didn't even come up with anything brilliant. All I did was look at a record from the perspective of the patients and the enslaved folk. And what it taught me was, and I don't have the definite answer, but I can at least surmise that there were ethical issues going on, right? Where the entire community would draw support. And Sims wrote that, I didn't. Both his surgical assistants quit. Sims told us that in his memoir. I didn't create this. And nobody ever thought to look at the census in terms of the black women. And so for me, it was the biomedical, ethic, uh, the biomedical ethical issue of the 19th century is that miscegenation was illegal. Now we know it happened, but it was illegal. But also he's trying to suture up or stitch women who are incontinent. So he's trying to suture up the holes. And literally this woman is forcibly, uh, you know, in, it's hard to even use the words. She is forced into a sexual relationship where she becomes pregnant and has to give birth, which then would break the sutures. So I'm saying as a medical doctor and surgeon, how do you allow this to happen? Because you are the person who's in charge of your hospital, right? So some white man, we don't know if it's Sims, it could have been, but it could have been some other white man who had you know, access to her body impregnated her during a clinical trial. And everybody focused on everything else, right? Black people don't experience pain and this and that, and Sims gave them opium. Instead of actually concentrating on the issue that an enslaved clinical patient going through an experimental trial became pregnant with a white man's child and gave birth to a mulatto child. And it was a black woman who was trained in you know, the, the, the work of 
uh, Beverly Guy Sheftel and Hortense Spillers and Kimberly Crenshaw and all of these amazing, Deborah Gray White and Darlene Clark High, because I had that kind of training and I'm gonna be real because I was a black woman and I understood the sexual assault and abuse of black women across time and space. I read the census differently. That's literally all I did. And so for my students who are often taught, I think misinformation around objectivity and all of those things, I'm like, bring your experiences into the archives with you because you might be able to interpret the sources differently than everybody else who wrote about it. Trust, trust that. So that's, that's my teachable moment. And, and I swore my mother to be quiet because I was like, I got to have something when I published this book that's going to be the smoking gun. So we Thank were quiet. Yeah, <laughs> what a story. Professor Amwad, how about a story from your research? Teach us something. Yeah, gladly. Um, as I was going over um, to one of my chapters, I actually realized that it's 41 years to the day um, when many Harlemites organized a protest to keep open um, Sidenham Hospital, which was one of uh, four major public hospitals that was cut in um, the end of 1980. Mm -hmm. And um, people don't realize, but um, Harlem Hospital, um, which was originally founded in 1887 on East 120th Street and, East, and the East River, moved in 1907 right across from Arturo Schomburg's uh, Center for uh, Negro Culture and Study. And um, there, you know, these two cultural institutions, one cultural institution, one medical institution, were always sort of facing one another. And when uh, David Ed Koch announced the closure of Sydenham in January 1980, it set off a whole uh, organizing effort on the ground. Um, you had a number of different actors get involved in resisting the closure of Sydenham Hospital. Um, you had within the structure of uh, what's called, you know, the Health and Hospitals Corporation, which is still in operation today. You had Harlem Hospital's uh, community accountability boards, um, which uh, over time realized um, how much of a symbolic place they had rather than a sort of substantive or policy role they had. Um, and they were organizing to uh, talk about um, the consequences of closing side in him and how that would place more pressure on Harlem Hospital. You had physicians themselves organized, uh, groups like Committee for Interns and Residents, as well as District 37 AFSCME, the uh, American Federation um, of State, um, County and Municipal Employees organizing, talking about the overwork of interns. At the time, interns had to work 120 hours a week. Um, they had to deal with decrepit facilities that were falling apart. And these physicians, these budding physicians, full-time attendings, uh, soon to be full-time attendings, worked with the community and understood that um, without community leverage, their own working conditions would not improve and they wouldn't have enough resources to provide uh, people on the ground. During this time, CIR, the Committee for Interns and Residents, starts something called the Patient Care Trust Fund. And because of you know, decades of cuts to the system, the union itself took it upon itself, uh, took it upon itself to raise funds to buy x-ray machines, to buy um, the latest medical tech so that physicians could stay abreast on the latest developments in medicine. Um, and you even had local community groups, a group called 100 Black Men, um, which had a um, healthcare subcommittee um, that focused on the fact that amidst all the brouhaha about the closure was a uh, omitted discussion about the fact that when you close a public hospital, you're also removing jobs from the community. And so, you know, I think this is a, a common theme in prior CBFS uh, talks, particularly the talk on um, education about paraprofessionals. Um, Harlem Hospital was a source of employment for those um, who couldn't get MDs, who couldn't get PhDs, but who wanted to have stable, meaningful um, careers in the community healing people. And the closure side in them threatened that. It threatened to cut their jobs, it threatened to move them and displace them from the local community. And so in September 1980, um, before then, you know, uh, the, all these actors also organized to lodge a suit in the Southern District Court of uh, New York, um, where they sought an injunction against closure. And in the final opinion of that suit, um, Judge Abraham Davis Sulfur, 
um, wrote an opinion where, uh, you know, plaintiffs were seeking an injunction on the grounds of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination in public accommodations. And Sofer writes that Title VI is not a guarantee against uh, 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 adversity. It's just a guarantee against discrimination. So you see how the legal system itself begins to separate um, some of the uh, legally cognizable claims about discrimination, uh, i.e. if you close this hospital, it's going to uh, disproportionately impact black and brown people. Those kinds of arguments had traction in the 60s, but by the 70s and 80s, um, they sort of fell apart in the court. And so by September 1980, 41 years to the day, um, you had community members protesting in front of Harlem Hospital, which by that point had absorbed um, some of the neighborhood family care clinics that Sidon had formally administered. Um, you had Mayor Ed Koch um, uh, originally agree to go to an event at the Schomburg and then cancel at the last minute um, because people were gathered and organized to confront him and ask him why he was so adamant about closing side of them. By the end of September, um, you had patients barricaded inside of them hospital. You had the police sent in. Um, they hurt over 30 people. Um, people who were kicked out of the hospital then go on a march um, down Adam Clayton Powell to 125th Street and protest in front of the government building there, moving back to side of them. But all of this action, all this community um, effort that happened on the steps of the Schomburg um, could not um, resist the sort of uh, deployment of uh, fiscal calculus, of studies of underutilization, this notion that an underutilized hospital or underused hospital was wasteful and thus needed to be reduced and cut down. Um, all of this agitation on the ground, all of this demonstration of the importance of an institution like Sydenham or an institution like Harlem, which was the first uh, uh, hire Dr. Louis T. Wright, one of the first um, Afro-American surgeons appointed um, to the, the staff, um, or to the, phys uh, the physician staff of a, of a public hospital, that all of this prior experience and importance and on a material plane and on a symbolic plane, all that could not stop um, David Koch from successfully closing site in the hospital. And during this time, it led to a lot of reorganization of care, in Harlem, Harlem Hospital the next year saw its uh, emergency room patient um, census increase, 100,000 visits um, with fewer resources, fewer uh, people to rely on, and more of a reliance on private institutions, including Columbia University, um, which supplemented the um, sort of evacuation of resources from Harlem with their own private physician staffs. So you see this sort of paradox where on one hand, the city is saying, let's save us some money and let's close these beds, let's close these extraneous hospitals. But on the other hand, not recognizing the hypocrisy of using um, the affiliation program and public monies to fund physician salaries. So I think it's kind of kismet that um, 41, day, 41 years to the day, we're gathering at least virtually um, to discuss this legacy because I think um, the remembering of this action despite um, the failure um, matters. It matters to remember the tactics and the efforts put forth. Um, it matters not to um, just write history as a, a tale of successes and a tale of the dominant class, but really writing history as a means of preserving memory, preserving energy, and preserving um, strategies that can be revived again as we you know, recently have traumatically dealt with the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And we're going with, uh, we're still uh, facing ongoing social movement um, action to keep existing hospitals open, not just public hospitals, but even private hospitals. So uh, that's my teachable moment. I think it's really exciting to be able to share the story because um, to this moment, we have a dominant policy discourse that says, Sure, COVID-19 led to really horrific scenes in our hospitals of overworked staff and people on gurneys and hallways that, that didn't have rooms, but we have vaccines now. It's not a big deal anymore. We can kind of go back to that sort of neoliberal template of just enough, but not too much, of stripping down resources to their bare bones until we have an emergency where we sort of reverse um, efforts. And so I think it's really important to think about this ebb and flow and how uh, resources are taken out of our communities, but also the 
significant levels of organizing um, required to bring in all sorts of stakeholders to stop the state or the city um, from taking more away from people. Thank you. Um, Professor Summers, how about a story from your research and what it shows us? Well, I, first of all, I have to say, uh, Professor Ahmad, I can't uh, wait to read your book. So I'm <laughs> really looking forward to its publication. It sounds just absolutely fascinating. Uh, so I, in order to um, provide my story, I have to pro uh, give a little bit of context. Uh, so for those of you who do not know, St. Elizabeth's Hospital is, uh, well, it's no longer a federal institution, but it was started as a federal basically soldiers and sailors, as well as civilian residents of the District of Columbia who were too poor to afford private treatment. And so uh, because there was always a sizable African-American population in Washington, D.C., from its earliest days, it admitted uh, African-Americans. And uh, so it was actually one of the uh, few hospitals that to have a sizable uh, Black patient population population. Um, within the same walls as uh, uh, white patients. And so, um, as you can imagine, there were any um, number of instances of medical racism, right? From segregation to uh, uh, forcing black patients to engage in certain types of labor uh, while they were always kind of couched in uh, their kind of therapeutic language, right? Like this, this would be good for uh, the black patients or it would also be good for the white patients to not be in proximity to uh, black patients. Uh, so, but one in particular, one uh, type of uh, patient management or uh, uh, strategy of patient management that I think is particularly telling um, was the housing of African-American male patients in the late 19th and early 20th century. So uh, throughout most of the 19th century, um, psychiatrists basically had a tripartite conception of mental illness, right? It was uh, mania, melancholia, and dementia. And mania uh, was essentially the result of the mental deterioration of the lower uh, strata of the brain, right? And melancholia was thought to be the uh, deterioration of the higher uh, strata of the brain. And so um, throughout much of the 19th century, uh, psychiatrists uh, disproportionately diagnosed African-Americans with uh, mania. Uh, and in, in many ways that it confirmed these assumptions about the intellectual hierarchy of the races, right? But it also um, attached particular uh, behavioral traits to uh, mentally ill Blacks as, uh, who were diagnosed with uh, mania, right? So, so mania uh, manifested in or kind of outward outwardly directed violence, right? Where melan whereas melancholia manifested largely in inward directed uh, you know, self-destruction, right? So you had suicidal uh, melancholics, but uh, you, know, you had homicidal uh, maniacs, right? And so, so this disproportionate diagnosis of African-Americans as uh, suffering from mania is one piece of the story. So in, in the late 19th century, um, St. Elizabeth begins um, housing federal uh, convicts who have been diagnosed as insane. And they established a, a, a hall, a building on campus, which later evolved into a complex to house insane convicts, as well as just criminally insane, right? Uh, those who were diagnosed uh, as being particularly depraved, particularly dangerous. Um, and from the 1880s, roughly the mid 1880s to the early 1930s, all African-American male patients, regardless of their civil status, regardless of whether or not they had been convicted of a crime, or even regardless of their diagnosis, were housed alongside in the same building and later in the same complex as the criminally insane and, um, and, and insane convicts, as it does white, white criminally insane and uh, white um, insane convicts. And so um, in many ways, this was really a reflection of the psychiatric professions thinking about uh, Black insanity, that it approximated the most uh, deranged, depraved, right, uh, the most violent 
uh, forms of white in this late 19th century narrative of, of uh, Blacks as naturally criminal, right? Uh, and so for me, what this really shows is the ways in which sort of, uh, medical discourse uh, doesn't so much reflect reality as, as much as it actually produces uh, reality, or at least the reality that the psychiatrists uh, want to see, right? Given the ways that their kind of ideas about race are also being shaped by a larger society. Thank you. And then Professor Evans, finish us off with the story from your research. And I like how we're kind of going back and forth between sort of medical racism and then resistance and wellness. Yes, excellent. Thank you so much. So you know where I'm going with this story. Uh, the, the moment, of course, uh, as I'm looking at Jean Theo Harris, uh, that really turned my research around was uh, finding a picture of Rosa Parks doing yoga. Now, I was not the first person to see the picture. There was a whole um, exhibit curated um, about Mrs. Parks. Uh, it, was in, it was in full display, but I think as, uh, as, as Dr. Deidre said, it's really about how you interpret the meaning of what's in the archives. And so I was looking at uh, Anna Julia Cooper's concept of regeneration. We look backward, for wisdom, we look inward for strength and we look forward for hope. So my question about, you know, as someone who used to have an ulcer and dealt with anxiety um, was about this concept of historical wellness. How did these women not lose hope? And so like the, the concept of, um, of, of Dr. D's um, medical uh, super body, right? Historical wellness for me is very fraught as an idea. It's not like, look at all of these strong black women. They made it through enslavement and they made it through resistance in the civil rights movement. And look at all of this is what they did. My question was how, how did they struggle with anxiety? What were, you know, how do we understand, how do we use their stories to understand mental health? Because usually when people say mental health, they mean mental illness. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to study this concept of, of, of wellness in its, um, you know, kind of strategic, as, as, uh, as Dr. George said, right? The how do, what are the historical strategies? So I started looking uh, again at memoirs. I have um, Africana memoirs collection. Um, there wasn't a database that was existing. So I just kind of obsessively created Black women's um, narratives a database of like 500 narratives from around the world. And so pulling from that, just looking at how people were managing stress. So I looked at um, meditation, music, prayer, yoga, and exercise, which is the American Psychological Association stress management strategies. Kind of these are the most popular. So I wanted to look historically at the most popular stress management strategy. In, in Black women's narratives. And so I, I came across um, a reference, a textual reference um, to Rosa Parks doing yoga in Our Auntie uh, Rosa, which was a, a collection of their, uh, of about 11 of her nieces and nephews who got together to write a narrative of the lessons that they learned from Rosa Parks' life. And they said, you know, well, Auntie Rosa used to uh, accompany us to yoga class. I was like, wait a minute, what? You know, and they had this whole image of her in, you know, in yoga pants. And um, they had these really beautiful and flowing um, images of her um, practicing at home, accompanying them in, you know, to, to, yoga, cl to yoga class. When I, when I went to look at the Library of Congress and found the pictures, there were a couple of things that spoke to me about what was happening. She had just turned in the particular pictures I'm referencing, 60. And she's doing quite advanced yoga, right? So there's a thunderbolt pose where you're sitting on your knees, but there's another pose where it's a bow pose where your feet are back behind your head. She's, and I'm like, Mrs. Parks is 60, is doing this. And so there's a, a number of things that this kind of spoke to me about that she was not only practicing yoga, 
she was teaching yoga. And I've given this presentation quite, quite a few times. And afterwards, there's always some young African-American women who come up to me, oh, thank you so much because, you know, my auntie and my cousin, my grandmama said that yoga is the devil's business. And, you know, and I'm like, um, Mrs. Rosa Parks, who was a deaconess in the me church, you know, was, was finding these things uh, to work effectively for her wellness. That was as, as much resistance um, you know, there's different ways to resist. And so um, my work is very much informed by um, public health and Kamara Jones in particular, her idea of um, the cliff of good health, right? And I'm teaching black women in health this semester. So shout out to all my students who are here. Um, it's, so it's contextualizing mental health where we understand it's not just a mental strength, right? There's all sorts of physiological things that are happening. Um, so individual behaviors must be contextualized within um, the, the social context of what's going, the social de determinants of health, and also the social determinants of equity. Mm -hmm. So it's how we understand resistance as this clarity that people have that's passed down um, in terms of practices and strategies. Um, because to, to wrap up, it, it's not just that Rosa Parks was doing this, it's where she learned it. If you look in her memoir, she learned it from her mother. She was homeschooled. And she said that, you know, or, or her mother was her first teacher is how she puts it. So part of the break for the day would be exercising every day outside and bending and stretching. So while there are several people that I, I mentioned, um, Harriet Jacobs, the Delaney sisters, Eartha Kitt, Rosa Parks, Jan Willis, and Tina Turner, all as elder women who throughout phases of history either mention meditation or yoga in their narratives and explicitly or in practice, that there's, there's so many ways that we can learn um, that what we conceive of as self-care um, as you know, yoga is something that skinny white women do and that you, know, you have to do, you have to be flexible, that we really have a, a chance to understand you know, if Harriet Jacobs is doing meditation while she's, um, you know, in hiding for seven years, um, and she mentions it explicitly in her narrative that we have these traditions that we must and can reclaim. Wow. All I can say is wow after hearing this uh, go around of answers from, you know, archival analysis to um, rethinking hospitals to mental health to Rosa Parks and, and others and opening the door to others, so, so powerful. I wanted to jump in and um, ask a question before we open it up to the audience. The chat has been going crazy as people are just uh, really so excited to, to um, evaluate and to um, send love to you for the amazing insights from your research. Of course, I have to ask about the pandemic um, that we're in because thinking about navigating health disparities, the realities of medical racism, the disinvestment in medical health, the landmines that, that threaten reproductive health and the persistence and growth of wellness and survival strategies despite it all, these are the realities of, um, that have been revealed and exacerbated by the global pandemic. What does the history you study provide us as a way to see this present more clearly? I'm gonna start with Dr. Summers. Well, I, I thank you for that. Um, and, and I wanna kind of frame my answer sticking within, uh, within mental health because I, I very much liked uh, Dr. Evans' uh, uh, comments um, in, in thinking about the ways in which uh, black people have historically right, um, pursued mental health through uh, these kinds of practices, yoga or meditation. I mean, we typically think of African American as that African Americans as actually having a very kind of adversarial relationship to the mental health care system. Right uh, in 1999, uh, the Surgeon General came out with a report that talked about uh, the reasons why. Uh, blacks kind of underutilize outpatient mental health services that and, and, and as a result are overrepresented in uh, inpatient uh, mental health services. And one of the 
main reasons that they give is that Black people, rather than turning to mental health care professionals, turn to the church, right? They turn to pastoral care. And so uh, what I, I, I very much like uh, the ways that um, uh, uh, Dr. Evans is really looking at other uh, forms of, of self-care that are aimed at, um, at uh, preserving mental health that aren't so necessarily kind of, uh, based in, in, in the Black church. And so one of the things that I, um, my work, I try to do in my work is really illustrate how Black people have always engaged in the mental health care system, right? Um, and they, out, they haven't, and um, as both treatment seekers, uh, as well as in other forms, um, as activists, uh, through community organizations, right? So if you think about, if you think about St. Elizabeth's Hospital, uh, in general, when there was a turn to the community mental health care movement uh, in uh, the late 1960s and, and early 1970s, um, Black residents in Southeast Washington, D.C., they wanted uh, a role, they wanted a seat at the table, right? To, what, what would these new services look like? How would they actually prioritize um, uh, the residents of uh, Southeast, right? How are they going to address these fundamental issues um, that uh, were kind of characteristic of, kind of urban uh, life at the time, right? Lack of jobs, substandard housing, um, uh, the lack of uh, delivery of social services uh, and, and, and so forth. And so, and you actually see this not, uh, in, in other cities, um, in, in Chicago, for instance, uh, the, the massive protests against Rahm Emanuel's attempts to cut uh, ser uh, mental health services in, uh, in the South Side, and particularly the Woodlawn Mental Health Center. So, so for me, um, what, what, what I'm trying to do with, with, with my work is, is, is actually complicate our understanding or the assumptions that we have about Black people's relationship to the mental health care system, again, as being one that's either apathetic or, or, or antagonistic, and, and, and to understand that uh, Black people have always um, had a stake right, in uh, preserving uh, mental health care uh, in their communities and in their families. And it just hasn't been through, again, kind of relying on uh, the church or, or pastors. But in, in some cases, it's been through yoga. In other cases, it's been through actually attempting to kind of manage the therapeutic experiences of their loved ones who have been institutionalized, right? Um, or, again, uh, playing a, a critical role in shaping what uh, the delivery of mental health care would look like in, in their communities. If I, if I can, um, I'd like to follow Dr. Summers um, with what COVID-19, I think, has taught the nation about its own unwillingness to face what Black people have been saying literally since the 1700s. And so I've written a couple of op-eds for some newspapers. I, I give a lot of talks to medical organizations, hospitals, um, do a lot of grand rounds um, for residents and MDs. And there are some things that history teaches us about the present. So number one, I often say that, and I mean this historically and symbolically, Black people have always been the canaries in the mine. And white folk generally will uh, pivot uh, remedies and, and, and restorative policies when they're impacted. So if we think about what COVID-19 has done, when it was just like, oh, you know, it's just maybe it's old people, oh, it's, it's black people, oh, it's poor people. All of a sudden, you know, we were the blame because we were obese or you know, just whatever. We didn't trust doctors. There was vaccine hesitancy, all of this stuff. And what I'm trying to say is, Black folk have been saying this for years. It's only when white folks start to lose their lives or their livelihoods that all of a sudden policies start to change. And so I show from the 1700s when you had black religious leaders, Richard Allen, um, and I am, I'm blanking on the name right now, but, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name, but, um, and his, his colleague wrote the first political- Absalom Jones. Thank you, Reverend Absalon Jones. Thank you, um, Martin. They wrote the first political tract against white people's claims that black people were criminal 
when they were actually recruited by white folk, including Benjamin Rush, right, to help out with a pandemic that was happening in 1793 in Philadelphia, an epidemic that was happening in 1793. And so it was based on this false belief that Black people were somehow immune to yellow fever. I mean, it wasn't true. And so Black folk are like, okay, let's show these people that we're respectable citizens. We will go and help. And what happens? White folk then say, okay, you all helped us, but you stole our money. You stole our things. All, so Absalon Jones and Richard Allen write a political tract. So the first political tract that was produced in this nation was tied to our health, to the, the restoration of our mental health, because Black people as a nation were being accused of avarice and criminality and pathology, and also the correction of medical misinformation. So that's what the past can teach us. I think the other thing is too, to think about the ways that Black people have always proclaimed that racism, medical racism existed. We've always said that. It wasn't until April, 2021, that the CDC as a representative arm of the government decides to proclaim medical racism as a public health issue. But black folk have been saying it all along and black reproductive justice and birthing justice activists had been saying it most loudly over the past three or four decades. And so what I'm trying to tell people is maybe we should start to listen to what black folk have said because the narrative has not changed. Everything that Absalon Jones and Richard Allen said is true. Black folk aren't biologically different. We, <laughs> the yellow fever kills us too, right? So they're correcting medical misinformation. They're politicizing their voices around medical issues and health and healing. The same thing that black uh, birth workers, reproductive justice activists, black women and men and children had been saying, please listen to us when, when we tell you, tell you we're in pain. Stop patient blaming and victim blaming. So that narrative is an unchanged one for centuries. And so I think COVID-19 really laid bare right, that there was no hiding place, to use the, the refrain of our elders, there was no hiding place at all. And the nation had to finally reconcile that medical racism exists and in fact cost the nation much more um, than, than what it is willing to, to pay. Um, it, it, it's just not a good cost benefit analysis in terms of the lives, the quality of life that's being affected by medical racism. I'll jump in here because that phrase cost benefit analysis um, is a lot of what my work engages and tries to problematize. Um, I think in a lot of the policy literature, there is a sort of, and I think we need to discuss this, this element of paternalism in medical practice, right? This element of paternalism in pu public policy that says that black people cannot think for themselves about what they need. I'm gonna say that again, black people cannot think for themselves about what they need. And what's so powerful about the archive, and these were papers I looked at the Schomburg, um, this collection by um, Dr. Jean Ann Polk, who was the, um, the managing director of the outpatient um, services division of Harlem Hospital. And this whole time, she's speaking much like um, Dr. Owens was, is about the fact that this is not an exception, this is a continuity that, um, even before the fiscal crisis of 75 and 76 in New York City, um, mayors like John B. Lindsay, a liberal Republican turned uh, Democrat, um, were innovating and pointing out um, hospitals in Harlem, in the South Bronx, in uh, South Brooklyn, and planning for the time when a crisis would come in to cut them, cut them, cut them down and close, close their facilities. And so I think um, what Dr. Summers is referring to about sort of how medical discourse shapes reality, this is very much something that um, I see in the archive in the political economy of our public hospitals. Um, there was an organization called um, the Concerned Citizens for the Preservation of Harlem Hospital. And these are also records available at the Schomburg. And in it, you see these very sophisticated analyses, both historical and statistical 
um, that Black Harlemites and, 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 and Puerto Ricans and Dominicans on the ground um, were um, enacting in order to make sense of why is it that the cuts always come to us? Why is it that they don't go elsewhere? And seeing this uh, literature really um, expanded my mind as to um, uh, how much we ourselves indigenously in our communities understand technical analysis and how technical analysis can't um, evacuate the consequences, the they call it disproportionate, but one could just call it discrim uh, discriminatory consequences of hospital closure in the neighborhood. Yes. I think history is really also really important here because you know, I, I like to think about the fact that the United States is the richest nation in the world and yet we are surrounded by impoverishment. That's a paradox to me. How yeah. is it that you have abundance coexisting with impoverishment and it's stratified and it's gentrified and it's ghettoized? Another thing that I'm really curious about, particularly in the law and particularly around colorblind ideology, particularly in the shift from disparate adverse impact, which just needed statistical evidence to show that something was discriminatory, to somehow in the 70s, this need to understand the intent of the policymaker. This heightens the standard, it makes it impossible. How do you get into someone's head and say, oh, they intended to discriminate against me? How, spe how especially do you prove that when there are multiple stakeholders in the room making decisions and the discriminatory effect has been distributed um, in terms of the actor? It becomes much more difficult in court to, pr to make these cases and, and prove these cases. So another question I have is, what is the unsubtlety of subtle racism? Why is racism all of a sudden subtle after the 70s, right? Somehow de jure segregation and um, uh, racist white Southerners is somehow the litmus test for structural racism. And after the Civil Rights Act of 64, after integration, after desegregation, these problems somehow disappear. We know, we don't need an archive. We just look outside, we walk outside our apartments, we walk around the neighborhood and we see different parts of cities. We know that there is an unequal distribution of resources, right? Um, but the law all of a sudden says that's not discrimination. This is, a, this is question, questionable to me. Um, and I wanna pass it to Dr. Evans, but I'm just so inspired by Dr. Evans' work because I personally um, did a 200 registered yoga teacher training at the same time that I was finishing my dissertation. And let me tell you, I don't think I would be here today if I didn't get that yoga certification. I needed the physical practice to allow me to sit in my chair for 12 hours a day. Yes. <laughs> you know, I needed that balance. And to Dr. Evans's point, there, is, there are black yogis today. There's the Black Yoga Teachers Alliance. Um, Yana, Yana Long um, has a great um, documentary that I'll put in the chat um, about the history that Dr. Evans has, has shared called The Uncommon Yogi, a history of blacks and yoga in the US. And it's, it, it, it explodes the mind. It, it, it expands the horizon to yeah, think that there's been a discourse about us not liking yoga, but there's a history there. So. Yes. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll jump right in because I'm looking at the time here and I want to make sure to be very concise. Um, um, but absolutely, I agree. Um, uh, Jana Long wrote the, the intro to, um, to Black women's yoga history. Um, the takeaway for me to answer the question is that I have a sense of clarity. Um, I gave a presentation called um, Loving All the Voices Inside My Head because I've collected this, um, this library of black women's voices across time and place, I have a clarity that has replaced the anxiety that I used to have. So at a time when everything is bad, literally, not hyperbole, everything is bad, everything is wrong. We have so many people who are hurting disproportionately, who are suffering um, across the nation, around the world, and, I have a deep sense of connectivity to them, but I also have a sense of clarity about, you know, what is, what's my compass? And so I would just say, because this is uh, about freedom, right? And black freedom that I learned from some, like the, the Delaney sisters, right? The, there was sweet Sadie and Queen Bess, and they were temperamentally very, very different. And some, you know, um, sweet Sadie would, would, you know, just smile and, you know, go on about her way and Bessie would raise hell 
and, you know, cuss people out and all that sort of stuff. But both of them in the end did what they knew was right. And so, you know, our freedom may not look like some people don't, you know, do yoga. Some people may run. Some people may, you know, uh, you know, do whatever you need for self-care. But I understand that I have a clarity. And the more that I am clear, the more effective I am in organizing to change the structural problems. Thank you. Thank you so much. The, the audience of over 300 people has stayed with us through this fascinating conversation. I just want to throw out some of the questions that we have collected, even though I know we won't have the opportunity due to time to fully address. Uh, there are questions about legislatures and um, the Black maternal health crisis. Should we be relying on them? There's a question about the Texas law that was mentioned. How will that affect Black, Brown, and poor women's reproductive rights? Uh, a question about the five practices of wellness, uh, meditation, yoga. Can you remind us of, of the other ones that were mentioned? Do any of you know about Welfare Island? Uh, one of our viewers uh, talked about her Black grandmother being hospitalized there for TB. Um, in the 1950s, and also about uh, why is it so prevalent to serve up hysterectomies to, in the Black and Brown communities? Why, why are we still uh, in that moment? So I know I've thrown out many lines, but if you could just hold on to one of those questions and give a quick answer, I would love to be able to go around for 30-second responses if you can. An impossible task, but I can, I can start. I have yeah. 30 seconds. I'm putting the in the chat. I'm putting the um, APA stress report from 2017, which was right after the 2016 election. And it was meditation, music, prayer, <laughs> yoga and exercise. Although there's quite a few. If you look at blue zones, I'll put that in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you. In, in terms of the hysterectomy uh, question, I mean, it's it's been documented now for decades that Black women are overrepresented in the removal of their uteri. Um, a large part of it is medical racism, but also the medical industrial complex makes a lot of money off of people's illnesses and surgeries. So when we think about the development of gynecology as a specialized field, the first successful surgery was the removal of, of tumors right, the ovariotomy. Um, and so, uh, and I mean, first abdominal, abdominal based one. And so after slavery, when black women's reproduction wasn't as highly valued and seen as a drain on society because these were not enslaved people who were considered pov uh, uh, property or assets, right? All of a sudden black reproduction literally turns on its head in terms of its economic value. So now it's a dream, right? And that has continued throughout, uh, throughout our freedom. And so now you have more black women who uh, after having, um, after having um, been found to have complicated pregnancies, um, C-sections, which also started with the experimentation of black women in Haiti and the US, but also uh, fibroid tumors, all of a sudden you have women for in their 20s, um, all the way up who are relatively healthy people being told you need a hysterectomy. And sometimes having those procedures performed on them without their knowledge and their permission. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a continuing problem, unfortunately. And I think it's because Black lives have been undervalued economically because of freedom. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, just speaking to the outrageous Texas law that uh, has just been passed. I, I think it's um, it's clear that uh, black and brown women are going to be disproportionately uh, impacted by that because I think middle income and 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 rich uh, rich women will be able to uh, go out of state um, to access abortion uh, services. But I'd actually like to just uh, flip that a little bit too. I would love to see a state uh, with a democratic legislature and a democratic governor pass a law that allows private citizens to sue gun dealers, right? Um, if, uh, if, if, if they, and, and whose 
who sold a gun to somebody who uh, ended up uh, uh, participating in uh, any kind of shooting, but certainly uh, mass shooting or committing mass shootings and, uh, and see, you know, it's, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So I, I'd like to say, and, and we all know that gun, the gun violence is a, is a significant uh, public health uh, problem. And, um, and of course now corporations can't be sued, but I don't know, I don't know um, about gun dealers, but I'd love to see some, uh, some uh, legislature uh, attempt to pass a law along those lines. As we come to the end of our uh, hour and a half or so, um, I wanted to pick up the welfare island question, um, uh, formerly known as City Hospital, um, which closed in the, in the early 60s. Um, and uh, I don't know much about that specific facility, um, but I, the TB question is really important. And I would like to maybe end, uh, 30 seconds is not enough time to get into it, but I would um, recommend to the person who asked that question or anyone who's interested in um, getting deeper into um, thinking about the history of medicine, history of, of specific illnesses, um, and with regard to tuberculosis, to check out um, Sheila M. Rothman's book, Living in the Shadow of Death, Tuberculosis and the Social Experience of Illness in America. That book has got a really good um, background on how um, hospitals today we treat as high tech, um, expensive, fancy, but hospitals actually have a root in poor law and providing charity care to those who couldn't afford family doctors. And so oftentimes people with tuberculosis were sent to what were called sanitariums where they could recover um, their lung capacity and heal. Um, but in terms of the theme of the discussion that we've had today about the inequality of resources in our cities, um, an essential book to read is uh, Samuel Kelton Roberts Jr.'s Infectious Fear, um, which is about the politics of disease and the health effects of segregation. That book is very excellent because what it does is it looks at um, maps, um, white reformers, white social reformers at the time um, did spot maps to try to find out where tuberculosis was being concentrated in an effort to sort of uh, ghettoize the problem and try to isolate it um, to protect um, uh, white people. And um, in that book, uh, Dr. Roberts really shows how um, even though on the face of it, reformers wanted to help black people, underlying a lot of that reform effort was a fundamental fear and alienation from us um, in our cities, in our communities, and that that thoroughly shaped how care was provided to us. And I, I'd argue that that same habitus, that same distrust between people influences how we've responded to COVID-19 today. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I didn't think it was possible, but but we did it. I think I really appreciate um, that attention was brought to the concerns of, of, of the people watching. And um, I want to thank you all alongside uh, Jean Theo Harris, I'm sure. Uh, we're so thrilled to have you start off these series of conversations. The next conversation will take place on October 7th on the topics of prisons, uh, political rebellion, political repression and surveillance, and maybe some rebellion in there as well, right? <laughs> uh, with Marisol LeBron, Vicki Law, Daniel Chard, and Stuart Schrader. Thank you so much to the Schomburg Library for, for hosting us. Thank you to the hundreds of people in the audience. Thank you to the panelists. I mean, I wish I could give you a huge round of applause so you can hear the filled virtual room um, that is really appreciated and learned so much today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.